Hey, I'm Grant, and welcome to Code Vein. This is going to be a preamble, basically an episode zero of this Let's Play, where I'm going to cover about why I wanted to play this game and talk about it, and go into a lot of different points about what I think to kind of set the stage for things I'm going to be saying with examples later on in the series. So if you want to go see gameplay, that's going to be in the next episode. However, if you are not familiar with Code Vein or you've never seen it, I really recommend going and seeing the Attract video. It's the video that plays if you are on the title screen for too long. This game has a bad habit of not really teaching the player or a viewer about its world or how stuff works. However, the Attract video does a nice little job of, while it doesn't really explain anything, it at least helps set the stage where you'll be like, oh, I understand that like, this is a thing. So when it comes up in the story, you'll be like, oh, I need to pay attention to that. Or just how stuff kind of works, you'll be like, okay, I vaguely get that. I'll go ahead and I'll probably put a little bit of it over on the video, but it is basically an animated music video, so I don't want it to be taken down. So I would heavily recommend taking a watch on your own. So let's talk about how I actually learned about Code Vein. I originally heard about it on Reddit, where people would keep posting these really intricate character creator screenshots and at the time i actually thought this was like a fighting game i thought it was like a soul caliber because i've never played soul caliber but i know it was it's always had a very big character editor and i thought this must just be some kind of competitor and it wasn't until actually later that i saw it it was for free on xbox game pass and i was like oh that's that thing i kept seeing all these shots for and all these like characters that people made from like just their own originality or I know I saw a lot of copies from like shows like I follow the Bayonetta subreddit someone made a copy of Bayonetta in Code Vein I've seen stuff from like Devil May Cry in there and so it kind of stood out for me to suddenly be like oh yeah what what is that game at the time I was actually making a point to play through a lot of Souls-like games. I think I had just come off playing Lords of the Fallen and Darksiders 3. Neither of which are particularly amazing Souls-like games. They've, they've got their own issues and strengths I would love to talk about someday. But I looked at the description for Code Vein and I was really surprised to see that it actually was a Souls-like. Basically, it was a game that fundamentally was derived from what... Dark Souls, Demon Souls, and Bloodborne had started. So I was like, well, clearly people seem to like this. I'm intrigued. So I downloaded it. And it kind of set me on this path of this game where it's like, I was surprised how much I liked it. I was really surprised. Especially the more I played it, the more I got into it. And here I am, I think, basically five playthroughs later, I've got all the achievements with which includes something like roughly two to 400 co-op sessions <laughs> or what have you. And I really wanted to talk about this game. I hadn't actually posted to YouTube for a good amount of time before this. So I wanted to find something I could come back and help fill out my backlog without too much time. So I would have time to work on other stuff. So I was like, oh, I kind of want to talk about a game. So I can do like a let's play. I want to do a review and I want to do a retrospective. But I didn't want to pick a game that I would just gush over. Like I don't want to be just saying like how amazing something is. And I also didn't want to pick something I wasn't passionate about. And so Code Vein for me falls perfectly in between those. Where this is a great game. It's got so many great ideas and such brilliance to it while also having some deeply fundamental flaws. So it makes it really good to talk about. The way I would describe this game is it is a amalgamation, just a Frankenstein of all these different aesthetics, themes, and mechanics from other games that have essentially been yeah, just Frankenstein together. And you would think that would be super soulless like you would think that hey bandai namco was just like hey we want a dark souls competitor <laughs> not competitor because they also produced that 
They want something like that again, but on the side. And clearly you would think that like, oh, this is going to be super like corporate and soulless and not that great. But it turns out, I think when you take all these nine out of 10 mechanics and aesthetics and themes and properly stitch them together, you actually turn out with a pretty eight out of 10 game. And not only is it a solid, technically good game in my eyes, it also possesses these weird flashes of brilliance that I think could really expand on the Dark Souls game style. In particular, I would love to see this particular genre of like Soulsborne or Souls likes kind of split into its own mini genre of say, we've got our hardcore classic survival Dark Souls where you have extremely limited healing, very limited powers, game, game is hard and it's the whole game's trying to wear you down. And then Code Vein would be more in this like action, almost vaguely devil may cry, if I can say, uh, genre where it's like, yes, it is still hard. That is the difficulty is still important to the experience, but the player itself is super empowered. And that was how I see this game could really split itself away while still really bringing a lot of just cool ideas. So let's go ahead and I'm going to give an example about these like flashes of brilliance. So the game clearly is just a big combining of lots of stuff, right? The character aesthetics clearly are very anime inspired, particularly Tokyo Ghoul. It's, I had not seen the series at the time, but I've watched the TV series after this because my friend's like, oh, they're clearly just <laughs> ripping this aesthetic away from Tokyo Ghoul. And then obviously the gameplay is very Dark Souls inspired. Most of the controls and mechanics are very similar or at least rooted in a similar mechanical style. And I would say even most of the enemies are lovingly ripped from Dark Souls. Particularly, I would call out the first two levels, basically the first bosses and their run-ups, where if you're familiar with Dark Souls, particularly Dark Souls 1, you will recognize essentially a lot of reskins from Undead Berg. So yes, this dude is a revenant, a lost, he's like looking for blood, but he's still clearly just the undead Hollow Knight. He's got a shield, he's got a sword, he acts the same. It's just a, essentially a reskin plus. Okay, this next enemy, clearly they're, yeah, same thing, revenant, lost, da, da, da. They're just dogs. That's all there is. They're in basically every Souls like ever. And then we have basically our Taurus demon stand-in, which... Isn't a bad thing. A lot of these are very good fundamental Souls-like enemies that are a great test of the game system. It's almost like a, I would compare it to like a coding kata or like a, uh, like this thing, like a fundamental. Like you put in all Souls-like just to kind of like test your system or let the player test the system. So it's not bad that these things are here. And really the environment of those first two levels, I like to describe as a cross between Fallout 4 in Darksiders 1, where it's like, it's your generic, dilapidated, like post Armageddon buildings. Also, you've got your crazy magical iron spikes coming out of the ground everywhere. Nothing you haven't seen before. However, in those first two areas, basically all the enemies are straight rifts from Dark Souls. You have what else? Um, you have like a couple like faster Revenants, like the uh, Thieves in Lower Undeadburg, you've got some Blob enemies, clearly also found in Dark Souls. But there's one enemy that's I've never faced before in any Souls-like. And I refer to them as these Monk enemies. They're not a mini-boss, they're just a regular spawn, and they're super just simple looking. Like, they literally just look like a basic guy, gas mask, unarmed. And you would think, like, walking up that they are going to be the Dark Souls equivalent of like the Torch Hollows or something where it's like, it, they're just fodder. They are absolutely not, <laughs> absolutely not. This one enemy, it's clear, someone put a lot of effort in some motion capture suit to do a fair bit of gymnastics and martial arts and map that onto a surprisingly um, brutal AI <laughs> if you let them go to town. And I think this enemy is just leagues above every other enemy in those two areas. And I think that's a perfect example of that flash of brilliance where, hey, can we just get more of like 
whatever guy made that enemy, let's get more of that. Cause like, that's like the fierce, like original stuff that like, I remember when I encountered these enemies and I still encounter them in, in my playthroughs. It's like, I'm scared of that enemy cause it's so unpredictable, but it feels fair. Like never in Dark Souls am I being like freestyly comboed <laughs> by an enemy. Like that was something I just wasn't prepared for. And it's clear like a lot of work went into this. So while there's not a super lot of originality in the opening third, it's by far the weakest third, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Even then you can start seeing like these flashes of just brilliance that I think the game as a series could really double down on and just make something truly amazing. I want to go ahead and talk also just about some other cons of the game or just things people may have heard. Like one of the things I think a lot of people experienced or have heard is that people start the game and they just don't get into it. And I believe a lot of that is because the opening third is pretty much the worst third in the game. That I think, I don't know if everyone shares that opinion, but I feel like that's a pretty strong opinion. To talk about the rest of the game briefly, second third, by far the best. Final third, it's it's solid. It's kind of, I felt, carried by the second third and how good the rest of the game is up until that point, or the middle is, rather. But the opening third, it's got by far the most bland areas, as I've discussed, by far the most bland enemies. You don't really get taught the game very well. Basically, the game does kind of expect you to come in with a certain knowledge of Souls-likes, it does have a bunch of really cool stuff that is unique to this game, besides even just the powers. However, stuff like launch attacks and quick drain attacks that are unique to this game, they are never actually taught to you. Your only hint you get is to go check a in-game hint menu in your menu. And it's available at any time, but it's surprisingly easy to forget is there. Or even if you do look at it, you'll look at like the first one and it's just telling you how to move around. So you might not go further. So I think a lot of people started this game and came in and it's like bland areas, combat doesn't feel great because they're not using this, the unique moves to the series. And just, they feel like, oh, it's souls likes because it's hard, not knowing that there is more depth there. You just gotta kind of get to it or know how to access it. Another example, I think, of why the opening third is particularly bland is the characters there's a not there's not a lot to of it like actually to them overall there is but not in the opening third and that is a unfortunate side effect of a cool storytelling element called the uh, vestiges basically to be very souls like because this game is very souls like your characters when they die they lose memories now in this game and this might be partially headcanon that this happens this way, but when they die, they drop a little crystal and that is their memory. And your character is unique because they can go recover these and then you can walk through a little dreamlike sequence with the character where they regain this lost memory. It's actually really neat. I think it's a cool way to tell like the story. You get in-game rewards in actual powers for it, which is always a nice thing. Plus it's entirely optional. Like even if you pick it up, you can, don't have to use it. You, can have, you don't even use it there. It's You have to take it back to your home base anytime you want, then watch it. And even then, if you don't want to watch it, you just want the power, you can just skip it. It's a nice little way to flesh out characters. But the natural downside to that is, is when you meet these characters, they're super bland because they all have, they're all standoffish and have selective amnesia. And ultimately, they barely know what's going on with the world anyway. Even if you like some of the characters opening bits, once you're about halfway through the first third, there's really not much to be said about these characters. It's just like, especially when so many of them fit like certain stereotypes, when you walk in and you meet them in the base, like, okay, I get kind of what your aesthetic is. I get what your aesthetic is. I get what your aesthetic is. And you, th I think at least most people feel like, okay, this is going to be the rest of the game. It's not quite the case, but I do think this is something I want to call out because you can see it kind of playing out. And there is a significant turn. Like there is a, specific point i would say in the cathedral after what i would call clearly the taurus demon ripoff boss so if you know the game you know the point i'm saying where the game all of a sudden spikes in terms of interest <laughs> and because of stuff like that but a lot of people don't get that far and that's 
I think what makes people talk about the game the way they do, where it's not even, I think people saying it's bad. I think they're just like, I just didn't finish it. I didn't hate it. It just was, it just didn't interest me. And which kind of sucks for the game, to be honest. Um, but I think it's by far, it's one of its biggest failings and what people hear about. It's like, if it was bad, at least then they could be like, see a sequel and be like, oh, that was terrible. But if they made a sequel, they must've fixed all that stuff. But if it's just bland, people might just end up assuming the sequel is bland 2.0 when I'm hoping it is not. Another thing that I think a lot of people hear about this game, and I agree with it, if you go read basically any set of reviews on the game, they're all gonna call it the same thing, anime souls. And I do agree with that point, but not for all the reasons that I think come to mind. So like, first off, the art style. I think that is a fair point. Art style and the themes. Clearly super anime inspired, particularly Tokyo Ghoul inspired. That is pretty obvious. I think maybe you do see upsides for that. Like, because the art style is a little cartoonier, I think it is easier to get a better character editor because if you're not going for like a more photorealistic look, you're not gonna end up with like odd looking cheeks on your character. They can kind of just like blur that a little bit and you can just edit the more artistic stuff that matters. But there are also like some downsides, like some characters a little bit more uh, tropey, I would say. And there's no way to not talk about the fact that the game has quite a bit of fan service in it. I don't think it goes too far. I feel like if I watch a show and they do fan service, usually it's like 10%, 10%, and they'll have like one episode or chapter or something where this is the fan service chapter. And it just spikes to like 90% of whatever the fans want, and then it goes back down the next episode. And usually that has no relevance to the plot. Code Vein's interesting because they don't do a lot of fan service, but it's pretty pervasive. And you can see that in the design of the characters. I would say both male and female. I would say since there's more female characters, you notice that most notably, especially pretty much immediately after starting the game. This is pretty obvious what they're doing. But... It's not too bad. I think they could tone it down a little bit. I think the main thing that kind of annoys me is the boss designs, is that essentially half the boss designs are clearly just supposed to be some variation of sexy monster woman. And that's just kind of odd. Like, okay, a couple is fine. Or it's cool if they can like work it in. Like I think one of the better cases of this is the cathedral boss where it feels alien and like weirdly like mystical but scary. And the opposite of this, where it feels like they're not trying, is, say, like, the fire level. That boss is basically just, I guess, fire catwoman in leather. That's pretty much just the design, I guess. So, <laughs> I don't know why they picked that when they could have done... When they clearly have done so many cool bosses otherwise. Particularly, I, <laughs> I really like the ice <laughs> levels boss. That's pretty neat. Also really like the, uh, I want to call it, I guess, like, the maze boss. Or... A couple other ones that I'll talk as we go through. But I do think you can see how people use the term anime souls. And it goes both ways. Like, when they say souls, it is clearly based off of Dark Souls. Right down to the mechanics and the aesthetics. And just the feel. Like, it's going to be tough. That's something I feel like you can't get around. And it's like, whether or not you like that's kind of like a personal preference. But when I say I agree with it, one, I do think it matches... But also I think there is a surprisingly amount of depth to what I think that really means. And that's going back to how it is a Souls-like, but it's empowering to the player. And I think what the creators were kind of going for <laughs> with that is being able to have moments where you have a fight, where you're fighting a boss, and throughout the fight, you are both powering up. So think like classic like DBZ style fights where they both start out like, what, power level one, and then by 10 minutes in, they're both super sane, etc., etc., etc. Compare that to, say, Dark Souls, where basically both you and the boss start at max power, and you just start, uh, like, dwindling. You're using up your healing and your resources, and the boss is using up, clearly, like, their health, as well as you're getting better at, like, reading their attacks, or, like, maybe you are killing their additional mobs. I think... They didn't want to do that style of Dark Souls, exactly. But they wanted the difficulty of it. But they also wanted to capture that anime-esque, like, super powerful, like, like, oh, my 
I, I'm enabled. I have all these powers I can do. I can control like the tempo of the fight or I don't have to like in Dark Souls, just let the boss do whatever and take my openings. I can force my own openings. But at the same time, they wanted like the difficulty aspect. So they didn't want to just do like a Dragon Ball Z game or I would compare it to say like um, a Mortal Kombat or like a Smash Brothers where if you get beaten up enough, the game will just give you your ultimate. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to make you work for it. And it's those two separate ideas where it's like you feel empowered, but it's still difficult is I think the big crux, like the big thing that makes Code Vein really a great different experience. The fact that it's tough, but empowering, but it's not handed to you, but you can do a lot, just really does so much. Like you can look at like all the crazy builds you can do. Like you can one shot basically every boss in the game, but you really got to know the mechanics and you really got to know what you're doing if you want to do it. But it is allowed. Compare that to, say, like, Dark Souls 1, where you can one-shot certain bosses, but you really got to work for it and look for certain, like, openings, and it's all, like, one big gamble. I think it's such just a cool system. And the fact, again, that you have to work for it, because, like, I would be remiss to not mention the sheer customization in this game and how the game really just wants you to be like, hey, just try everything. You want to try every weapon, every power, every combination of power, just go do it. Like that's clearly core to the game and it's class system. It's hard to talk about that without actual concrete examples like I'll have in the actual Let's Play. But the, just all that combined is such a great thing that I think is what makes Code Vein so good. <laughs> like... Not, I don't even want to say so good because it feels like it's only like 7 or 8 out of 10 depending on where you are at in the game. But it's just got a lot of potential. It's hidden behind the first third and it's hidden behind not being taught to players or having to look up stuff on the wiki or having to like watch a YouTube video. But it's got a lot of potential. And I want to roll into why I want a sequel for this game. And it's exactly that. It's got a lot of potential and a lot of brilliance but it's kind of stuck with all this extra chaff. And it's in such a good spot because of that, where if they could just take the stuff that works, rebalance it, you know, to do certain things, because even stuff that I love in the game, like the Iker system or the class system, I think it's got a couple fundamental flaws because they're trying to do like too much. If they could just like round those out while also like properly handling the opening game and teaching the player and showing that like, hey, yes, you can play it. Like, technically, if you want to go play it with, like, one weapon, no powers, no companions, you can do that like Dark Souls. But this is the way we want you to play it. Like, this is the this is the unique Code Vein way. I think they could... They're in a position where, like, the second game, as rare as it is, could be, like, the defining game in the series, not the first one. And that's why I'm hoping so much that we will actually get a sequel. It's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to make this... Let's Play series, as well as really the review and more, moreover, the retro, just to get out that idea. It's like, hey, I know it doesn't look like a lot from the surface, but the more you play it, there's a surprisingly high amount of quality there. It just needs to be brought out in a sequel. And I'm hoping Code Vein ultimately becomes that game where it's like, hey, I've never played the first game, but I played the second and I loved it. If you want to see a great example of this, I would relate it to Devil May Cry. First DMC, it's dated, still a great game, but very experimental. Second game, not that great. But then the third game blew the first game out of the water. And it's basically like, the third game is a masterpiece. <laughs> and while the other two exist, and the first one's still very solid, it is a lesser version of the Masterpiece 3 is. And I'm hoping whatever Code Vein 2 is, is going to be exactly that for one. Where it's like, hey, yeah, one, it's cool. I went back and played it and liked it. But when I tried it originally, I didn't like it. But man, I love two. I could play two forever. And that's really kind of all I want in a sequel. And kind of my uh, call to action to hopefully we'll see more out of this series. But let's actually get to some of the gameplay. So I'm going to be doing this little Let's Plays mainly to get footage for my final little retro and review. But I want to also talk about stuff as it comes up so I can actually move the camera around and actually talk about the bosses and... To be frank, I haven't played the game in like six months, so I kind of want to get back to it so I can properly uh, think my thought, all my thoughts through and make some good points. So let me know what you think as stuff kind of comes up, but let's get to Code Vein.